And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here, what games hit our tables. Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and any cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review on tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. So one of the games I did, uh, one of the things I did is this past Monday, I convinced my Monday night game group to give Tonto 4A a try. Um, the biggest thing I found with Tonto, this is what I've had the most fun with, is the change in attitude about the game from when the players first see it and sit down to the table and when we finish our first game. And also the fact that every time we finish our first game, people ask to play a second time once they get to see it. Like, as we talked about a lot last week, the theme in this deck building game is unique. Um, I talked about it in the review and our whole last podcast was about the potentially problematic themes in this game. Because in this game, you are playing Japanese uh, head of a household collecting Japanese maids. And I got to say, this theme puts people off when I introduce the game. Now, in most cases, with the people I've shown it to, because they're people I trust and I know well enough that I can present a game like this, is it's usually a matter of some giggling and some suggestive remarks. Um, people don't take the game very seriously at first at all. And despite this, every single case of me teaching the game, by the end of it, the players like do a 180, like that complete turnaround. Players are then commenting not about the art, not about the pillows and the theme, but how good the game is. Like, everyone literally seems surprised. They're like, oh my god, there's a really solid deck builder here, despite this rather unique theme. I'm in the exact same boat. I felt the same way the first time I played it. Because this game really isn't just cute anime maids and a bit of fan service, but a solid deck building game that I personally prefer over most of the early deck builders like Dominion. Yeah, I have to say, uh, you know, it the the general sort of overall view of this game seems to be this is a better Dominion than Dominion. And that's uh, sort of what, you know, a, a common theme you see in reviews of this game. And no, that's based Dominion. I, I know Dominion still, they're putting out expansions. People love it. I quit after the second expansion. It just wasn't for me. So compare it to base Dominion. For all you Dominion fans out there, I know the game evolved and big money wasn't always the way to win. And it got better, but I didn't keep up. With well, it. to be fair, Tonto Quarry has evolved too. There are a that's number true. of expansions out there so you can expand your maid game as well. Yeah, that's true. Maybe maybe I'll get Japan anime games to send me those sometime. We'll see. I'm trying to get them to send me the Robotech games. That's what I really want to review from them. That's what I want to check out. The defense of the SDF-1. The giant SDF-1 you put in the center of the table. I want that game. You just want the SDF-1, whether it's a good game or not. That's be it. Well, oh, that's true. <laughs> there, there's some, chi oh, yeah, there's some childhood Robotech's memories. With, uh, like, chi yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Robotech's up there with Star Wars from my childhood. That was a big deal. So after playing Tonto for the first time with this group of players, I then broke out Imhotep, Builder of Egypt. Uh, this was the first time my Monday night group got to play it, so we just stuck to the A sides of the board. We played a four-player game, went over just as well as did with the game of Torian that we talked about last week. Now, this past Saturday, I helped facilitate a board game night at the CG Realm. Now, as part of this, I was featuring Imhotep. I had actually hoped to feature Dead Man's Cabal, but sadly, the store has not been able to get copies in. So we haven't been able to pull that off. So instead, I grabbed Imhotep. I, I had my copy of Imhotep there, and I was willing to teach anyone who was interested how to play it. And throughout the night, I ended up teaching two games. Now, the first game, again, I just stuck to the basic building tiles using the A-side, taught two brand new people the game who had never seen it before. Deanna joined in as well, so we had four players. Uh, that game went really well. Now, had the store had the game in stock, they would have sold a copy right then because Chad was impressed. All right, so I think we've we've pretty much established now that you are an Inuo Chep fan. Uh, you've now played, yep. you know, you've played both sides now, and we'll, we'll get into that a little more later. Um, this game's got expansions. Is it is it a good enough game that it's something you'd be willing to invest further in, you know, given, you know, given the, the ability to invest in anything, uh, yeah. you know, is is it a good enough game that you want to see where else it goes and how much better and, and, you know, bigger and better? Well, there's only one actual expansion. There's just a ton of add-ons and downloadable and promos. There's one box set that just came out this year, was premiered at Gen Con. I happen to already have a copy of that. So I might answer the one question. What the expansion does, the big thing it does is it replaces all the boards. The boards already have an A and a B side. It gives you a C and a D side. 
which leads you to 1,028 possible combinations for Imhotep. And I got to say, that's pretty cool. If you want replayability in your game, that's that's pretty pretty hard to beat, that number right there. Like, 1028 possible board combinations is, is pretty dang impressive. So, yeah, I think it looks pretty good. At this point, though, I'm not even going to break it out. I'm still showing people the game. I'm still trying it out and i've only actually gotten to try the b-sides once so far which was actually the second time i played on uh saturday so we played a game of tyrants of the underdark the game i just reviewed and after playing that uh we took all the players who played tyrants of the Underdark, three of us and we went over and went back to imhotep and now this time we played the b-sides and what we did is we put all the b-sides out so these were all players who had played the a-side before so we put it to the b-sides and i gotta say uh, there's a reason it says try the A-sides first because the B-sides were a bit more fiddly than the A-sides. And a lot of the sites had triggering actions, so it's like do a thing and then do something else, which immediately adds to the complexity level. Now, for the obelisk, instead of just stacking all your cubes up, you have to wait till you have three. But as soon as you have three, you score. And then the players who do that first get the most points, starting at 10, then 9, and 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. For the pyramids, instead of one pyramid, you're building three smaller ones. Um, and then some of the spots give you actions. Now, these extra actions are things like getting to put a brick on a boat, taking a market card from the top of the deck, getting cards from the quarry ahead of time just for building the, temp uh, the pyramid. Uh, the temple is the most complicated one because now you're still looking from the top to see who gets a thing, but now they get a choice. They either get points or they get something else. Uh, again, the something else is uh, market cards or bricks from the quarry. Burial chamber is still area majority, but it completely changed it. So it's based on rows instead of touching blocks. So instead of area, and then even the market's different. The market has a spot where you can push your luck. So what instead of having one face up card, it has two face down. So you don't know what they are, and you draw it, and you pick from the two. Well, that's certainly certainly a wider range. Um, I guess, and, and the reason I was asking, I got confused, because I was thinking there's also Imhotep the Duel, but that's actually a separate that's game. That's a standalone. That's, that's a standalone. Yeah. yeah, it's a two-player-only version, which I have not gotten to check out. Now, as for the new spots, the B spots, they're just a touch more complicated than the basic version. Uh, well-balanced, they seem like they'd mix well with the other side. So that that's my next thing, right? is play the game with someone who's played before. Oh, again, I will only stick to A-side with a new player. But as long as I got someone who's played before, I'm going to mix the A and B boards. I'm literally going to shuffle them. I'm, you know, I'll take them, shuffle them somehow, and then throw them out. And I am looking forward to checking out that expansion, but I want to play a couple more times with the B-sides before I do that. All right. Now, I did mention the other game I played at CG was Tyrants of the Underdark, but you already heard my thoughts on that one in our review segment. <laughs> all right. So uh, I've gotten yeah, mostly almost all my games right now are uh, on uh, on board game uh, board game arena, uh, although apparently I've been doing well, in, at least in some of them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sean had quite the win at Seven Wonders. I still have never seen a score that high. That was ridiculous. <laughs> I, I don't know. I. Yeah, I don't know. And I thought I had it, but I wasn't. You were on the other side of the table. That's the thing I don't like about Seven Wonders. Well, right? and that's like, actually, I can't do anything about the person who's two away. It's actually interesting because I've, I've been thinking, and I, I'm almost always next to D. Like, huh. whenever I'm buying something, it's almost always D. But I, I haven't been used next to you on that game in a very long time. It's I weird. Didn't... It's it's you know, just one of those things where I've noticed, you know, every once in a while you go to buy a card and it's like, oh, it's always the same people. Yeah, like I, I've had game time next to me as long as I can remember. Yeah. It's, it's switched between Satura and Frostbite. Right. But it's almost always game time next to me. Yeah, it's, it's odd. I don't know why. I'm not sure what they're randomizing. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like for that. Uh, but like, yes, I, I realize in Seven Wonders, you can technically realize that you might be passing something three down to someone, yeah. but I don't pay that much. I pay attention to the people next to me. Uh, the only thing I pay attention to, I, or I've been trying to pay attention to, is science. Uh, is the, yeah. uh, you know, I try to make sure. Yeah, is anyone collecting yeah, these? Who's collecting them? Do I need to burn it or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, steal it? Um, all right. So how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming mm -hmm. week? All right, for those of you here live and local, uh, join me this weekend. Easy mode, 5 p.m. till 10 p.m. I'm going to be bringing Imhotep. I'll be bringing Tyrants of the Underdark for sure, as well as some other games. Uh, also, stop by the booth uh, for the CG Realm at Comic-Con this weekend. Now, for those of you listening, 
on the podcast next weekend, which is the weekend coming up for you guys, is our big level up event for the CG realm for Extra Life. I'm going to be running some worldwide wrestling. I still have to put that in the Facebook group. I haven't decided if I want to do a noon session or a 6 p.m. session. We're also doing a big RPG book exchange, something I missed in the announcement. That's, that's 10 a.m., uh, think... not noon, isn't it? Oh, yeah, sorry, 10 a.m., 10 a.m. Sorry, 10 a.m. <laughs> for the first sitting, 6 p.m. for the second sitting. I still don't know which I want to do. And it's not uh, the 10 a.m. I'm going to be there the whole time anyway. Just think, if you join in World Wild Wrestling, you too can have a giant microphone that you can yell in while you're role-playing. Uh, I won't be giant. It's giant. my old Ars Technica yeah. microphone. Uh, I got my old mic from podcasting that it started making noise, which was weird. All right. Uh, and we're just going to hop back into the lobby here for a minute. Uh, Brian actually found at Target, they have reissued Escape from the Death Star from the 80s. What, like the classic 80s game? Yes. Wow. And I have to say, uh, the, the he posted the link to it in the uh, the chat room, and this yep. thing reads like like candy being waved in front of collectors. It's got <laughs> it's got the Grand Moff Tarkin figure, and one oh, of the geez. actual selling points. So there there are there are five highlights listed, and one of them is R two D two depicted on spinner. <laughs> like that is a that is a you know right there the quote. R2-D2 depicted on Spinner, the Star Wars Escape from Death Star game, includes a spinner featuring an image of R2-D2. Like, I, th I think they must have taken the flavor text or the, the, the sales text from the 80s. I, they probably <laughs> did. And uh, it, it, I, that was one I did not have when I was a kid. Uh, I, had a, I had a different one where you had little X-Wings on a base. I don't remember what it was called. And apparently this was actually originally released in 1977. So it was right wow. on the heels of the, uh, yeah, the that movie. would have been the original movie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this game is for ages eight and up, but, uh, you probably want to be a lot older than that. If you want to actually enjoy the game. Yes. <laughs> and you're, you're only going to enjoy it for nostalgia's sake. I would nice looking Tarkin figure. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very classic Kenner Tarkin. Um, yeah. all right. I never had a Tarkin. There. Well, I think that's probably why. It's probably, yeah, yeah. 